exclaimed, unplayable. Even after our man had played it and for years no one else was able to follow so that the composer's fury would have raged for naught and wagging tongues could keep alive the original dedication from the title page he shredded. Oh, if only Ludwig had been better looking or cleaner or a real aristocrat, fun instead of the unexceptional fun from some Dutch farmer. If his ears had not already begun to squeal and whistle, if he hadn't drunk his wine from lead cups, if he could have found true love. Then the story would have held. In 1803, George Paul Greenbridge Tower, son of Friedrich Augustus the African Prince and Maria Anna Sovinki of Biala in Poland, traveled from London to Vienna where he met the great master who would stop work on his third symphony to write a sonata for his new friend to premiere triumphantly on May 24th, whereupon the composer himself leapt up from the piano to embrace his lunatic mulatto. Who knows what would have happened? They might have palled around some, just a couple of wild and crazy guys strutting the town like rock stars, hitting the bars for a few beers, a few laughs, instead of falling out over a girl nobody remembers, nobody knows. Then this bright-skinned papa's boy could have sailed his 15-minute fame straight into the record books, where instead of a Regina Carter or Aaron Dworkin or Boyd Tinsley sprinkled here and there, we would find rafts of black kids scratching out scales on their matchbox violins so that someday they might play the impossible. Beethoven Sonata Number no. 9 in A Major Opus 47, also known as the Bridge Tower. Um, according to Ms. Papendiek, young George first shows up on the British uh, side of the channel when he is nine years old, and he had just come from France. Now, uh, what, what happened was that his father, once he found out that he had a prodigy on his hands, and as I said, he was playing when he was five years old, he decided to take his son on the road. Because if you were a musician back then, you have to think, this is 1789. There are no recording studios. There are no record deals or anything like that, you had to find a patron. And so his father began to take him across the continent and one of their first stops was Paris in 1789, which was not a good time to be in Paris, <laughs> if you remember your history. <laughs> and they were right there, right in the thick of it. Um, he had a concert in one of the subscription concerts there where a lot of diplomats and uh, all of the, uh, the diplomats and the, the foreign cultural attaches came to, to the concerts because that's where you met people, that's where you did deals. So um, there are a lot of different people in this poem. One of them is, um, I think you'll recognize. What doesn't happen? The notion that the carriage wheels clattering through Paris remind him of the drums from the islands in his father's tales. Click, clack, sputter, whir. He could make a song of it, dance this foreign hand down the cobbles of the Rue de Bac as he balances his small weight against the pricking cushions. Clack, sputter, whir. All the cadences jumble together except the thudding dirge of his heart. That he can see in curtain twilight, the violin case in his lap twitch with every jounce like an animal trapped under the hunter's eye. That he can sense down shrouded alleys, danger rustling just as surely as he can feel spring's careless fingers feathering his chest and smell April's ferment in the stink of the poor marching toward him though none of this is true. He hears nothing but clatter. 
He can't see the rain-slicked arc of the bridge passing under him as the pale stone of the palace rears up and he climbs down to be whisked into the massive Salle de Machine, his father's cloak folded back like a bat's tucked wing. Because it was a dry spring that year on the continent. Nonetheless, he ignores his heart's thudding and steps out onto the flickering stage, deep and treacherous as a lake still frozen at sunset, aglow with reflected light. Soon the music will take him across. He'll feel each string's ecstasy thrum in his head and only then dare to open his eyes to gaze past the footlights at the rows of powdered curls. Let's see the toy bear jump his hoops, nodding, lorgnettes poised, not hearing, but judging. Except for that tall man on the aisle, with hair the orange of fading leaves, and the two girls beside him, one a younger composition of snow and embers, but the other, oh, the other, dark, dark yet warm as the violin's nut-brown sheen, miraculous creature who fastens her solemn black gaze on the boy as if to say, you are what I am, what I long to be, so that he plays only for her and not her keepers. And when he is finally free to stare back, applause rippling over the ramparts, even then she does not smile. Do you recognize anyone? It's quiz time. <laughs> that orange-haired gentleman? It's, it's Thomas Jefferson, who, if you remember your American history, was, you know, uh, in Paris right at that time. And he was also a, a amateur uh, violinist too so he did go to the concerts a lot and and I kept thinking to myself I, I live in Virginia in Charlottesville Virginia which and the University of Virginia was of course designed by Jefferson and Monticello is sitting right up there looking down on us and um, <laughs> I kept thinking it would be so wonderful if they were there at the same time in the same city it would be so wonderful if Jefferson had actually been to a concert by Bridge Tower. And I searched, and I searched, and I bugged people, and I, you know, it was just driving me crazy, and, f and everyone else in my family crazy. At one point, my uh, husband, Fred, just said, oh, just call the poem What Doesn't Happen, and you can do whatever you want to do in the poem. And so <laughs> I said, all right, I'll do that. Um, so. Um, I called the poem that, and, I was and it freed me to work on it and to imagine, to have this imaginary scene of what would happen if they had met. And I was just finishing the poem when a docent at Monticello, who had, I had been bugging, said, I have a book here you might be interested in. And it turned out that it had just come out. It was a book um, which just had a list of all of Jefferson's catalogs. He kept copious notes. And he made a note of everything, every seed he planted and where he planted it and everything like that. And he made a list of all the concerts that he had ever gone to. And he also made a list of the program. And in one of them, in May of 1789, there was Bridge Tower. So I said, yes, yes, you know. It's it's one of those things where you just feel like, okay, now I can just sit back and rest for a while. But I didn't. I didn't. Um, it made sense. I mean, and I think that that's what happens with, with art when art meets fact. Is that if you know your, if you know the person well enough, or you think you know them well enough, there there is Jefferson who loved to play the violin, and who did go to the concerts. Would he not have gone to something like this? You know, would he, it, it seems like a, like a no-brainer. I just couldn't find the the documentation, so I was freed as a, as a poet to just decide. Now I don't know if Sally Hemings was with him, <laughs> so I kept the title. Why not? 
But if she wasn't with him, she might have been there in spirit. Who knew? Um, it obviously Paris was too hot to stay in for very long. And so this father, and we don't know very much about the father, the African 